Hello and welcome to Digital Nation, your visual tour of the UK seen through the eyes of our local TV channels. In this week's show, we discover the last resting place of a Russian princess. We meet a crazy cabbie who's revived a tradition to brighten up any journey. And visit a museum in Sheffield, housing some of the oldest firefighting equipment in the UK. If you want to contact us, you can do so on Twitter using the hashtag DigitalNation. First up, we're in Bolton. So have you packed your bucket and spade? Now, you might think that's a strange question, as the town's nowhere near the sea. But one theatre company has created its very own indoor beach, hoping to attract some new audience members to live theatre. That's Manchester. Finds out more. It's often said that if you put your ear against a seashell, you can hear the sea. Well, if you walk past the Octagon Theatre in Bolton, you can visit the beach. I'm a firm believer that um, the one thing that all families love to do is go to the seaside. And at the Octagon, we're really passionate about getting people to come to the theatre who's never been before. And I thought, well, if you've never been to the Octagon, you might not want to come and see a play, first of all, but you might come to a beach inspired by Blackpool and Bognor, where I used to go as a child. The theatre is like Blackpool in miniature. Face painting, sandcastle making, ice creams for sale, arts and crafts. You can even ride the donkeys. All this hard work would have been very difficult to set up. What do theatre committees think when the director says, let's make the theatre a beach? Um, I think um, quite a lot of people thought it was a bit bonkers, um, but then it's kind of my job to believe that um, believe in the idea, I guess, and I firmly believe that people want to come to the theatre, they just don't know we're here. So I feel it's my job to fling open every door and every window and show them what we have to offer. Right, wait there, I'll join you. I'll bound up the stairs and be up in a boat. Six tonnes of sand were brought in on wheelbarrows. Nothing but hard work, heavy lifting and moving things around. A lot of hard work and a lot of manpower. Um, so it, it was obviously Elizabeth's idea um, to bring the best of Blackpool Beach to Bolton and have it in our auditorium. Uh, to bring people to the auditorium that have never been in the theatre before and um, people of Bolton that might not have ever come into the theatre even if they've walked past it lots of times. It's not the first time the theatre has been transformed with stuff that gets everywhere. We've worked with mud, water and now sand so we, we've had some elements of being able to <laughs> manage it but um, uh, three men with wheelbarrows is what happened yesterday. <laughs> Big pole, a big pole. Over to West Belfast now, where the annual Fahler Festival brings thousands onto the streets and is a reflection of the strong multicultural community spirit in this part of the city. Every year, youth clubs, sports clubs and community centres come together to put on one of the biggest carnivals in Europe, projecting the positive side of an area with such a challenging past. Well, Fela really is a festival for all the people of Belfast and back when it's roots from 1988 when the festival was set up, it was all about the community and really showcasing what our community in West Belfast is proud of. And we've carried that fight on now for the last 28 years and, you know, for us in the festival office, we work 365 days a year to put on the best uh, example of West Belfast that we can. So we have a, a year-long community engagement programme and a youth arts programme which works with all the different youth clubs, GA clubs, sports clubs. Um, and, and young people just right throughout the city to make sure that come Carnival Day that as many people as possible are involved in the actual parade. It really is a whole collection of, of all that work throughout the year which accumulates in the, in the big Carnival Parade that we'll see today. And anyone coming here today, um, be they visitors from anywhere else on the island, uh, Ireland here, or, or, or from anywhere, you know, international visitors, they'll really see a proud community uh, who are proud of their culture, their heritage, their language, their sport. Um, and the arts and sport, I think, is a fantastic mechanism to show and to showcase West Belfast for, for what we are great for. In today's digital age, if you want to know the time, you probably check your digital watch or even your mobile phone. But previously, there was a British institution known as Tim, the speaking clock. And it's still live, ticking, and based in Newark. At the first place, it will be 7, 36, and 10 seconds. 
The first, the original, the Mark I speaking clock. Capable of handling 100 calls at once, this machine ticked and turned its way into British life in 1936. Now, it's housed at the British Horological Institute at Upton Hall near Newark. It had to work 24 hours a day. It had to work uh, throughout the country once the trunking network extended uh, nationwide. Uh, and it had to be accurate within a tenth of a second. These one of these sort of institutions, people used to phone up TIM, you know, T-I-M, then, re then more recently, I think in the 1980s, it became 123 when you phoned it up. And it is still accurate within a tenth of a second. They can't get any better than that, I understand, because uh, the delay that occurs over the landlines when you pick up the receiver. The Mark I model's in good company. Under the very same roof, you'll find Britain's second speaking clock with updated technology and an all-new voice. At the third stroke, it will be seven o'clock and ten seconds. The BHI has been caring for these two speaking clocks on loan for years, along with more than a thousand other timepieces. Now, as BT rolls out its search for a new voice, it's donating them to the Institute. It's also given the BHI a missing piece in its collection of horological history, a digital Mark IV speaking clock. At the third stroke, it will be one o'clock precisely. Now BT is asking you whether you've got the tone, the timbre, the talk to take the speaking clock further into the 21st century. And if you needed proof that people will listen, the speaking clock still gets 13 million calls a year. I think it's a British tradition and the fact that we still retain around 12, 13 million calls in 2016 is amazing. And I think it's just something that people know are there. It's a fondness for it, a love for it and probably very crucial if you, if you do need that accurate time. The speaking clocks had temporary voices in the past, like Seleni Henry, pictured here picking up an honorary degree from Nottingham Trent University last month. This time, though, they want to make it permanent. Our next stop is Edinburgh, where we meet theatre company Frozen Light, who've created a multi-sensory immersive experience aimed at young people with learning disabilities. It's the story of the forest, which comes to life using touch, taste and smell in a clever and inventive way. The Forest is a multi-sensory production for audiences with profound and multiple learning disabilities. It's the story of Thea and Robin who both are very lonely in their lives in the city and they get drawn into the forest on a multi-sensory adventure. Here we are. to this show today because it's the, as far as I'm aware, the first show for adults with profound mental and physical learning disabilities um, and it was amazing, it was just absolutely, what an experience, it was wonderful. The show was brilliant and uh, <laughs> so those that, but a bit powerful. Then we had thunderstorm, then the rain. It was fantastic, the rain bit was my favourite bit. It's like being in the trees. Yeah, like being in the trees. And tasting the fruit oh. and the peach. Oh. Yeah, very interactive. Yeah. I think they're quite surprised because they're not they're used to, you know, if they're gonna to go to a situation like that, they're used to not being a part of the audience, it not being so interactive. We only create theatre for audiences with profound and multiple learning disabilities, so the way we devise our work is actually created specifically around our audience. So it's really about thinking about our audience thinking about our audience's needs and what we know is our audience experience stories and the world through the multi-sensory so it's about looking at how we can develop and grow a story using multi-sensory elements. Butterflies are one of our most beautiful and fascinating creatures and it's a worry when their numbers start to decline. Climate change, loss of habitat have been cited as causes. But over in North Somerset, there's a thriving collection of over 350 tropical specimens. And judging from the expression on one young visitor's face, they're as exciting as ever. Getting in a flap about the number of butterflies and their decline. More than 350 are here at the North Somerset Butterfly Centre. It's lovely. I'm the first time I've been here and the variety of them are wonderful. Lovely colours. Mm. Really good. It's fantastic. I never knew it was here so it was a real treat to just happen upon it and, um, and it's really nice to be able to spend a few 
few minutes just walking around, seeing the butterflies. I like the blue ones and the white ones. It's been the home to thousands of butterflies and Pete has been growing his grand selection over the last four years. They are small and there's a lot of things out there that want them for lunch. And because of this, it means that they've got to find ways of not getting eaten. And that leads to all the different colours, all the different patterns, shapes, sizes, and all the different behaviour and attitudes. A butterfly that's poisonous, it wants you to know. It's very happy for you to just sit there and watch it. It doesn't fly away at all. Um, whereas a butterfly that's very tasty will bomb around like nothing on earth, and very often when they land, they completely disappear because they look like a dead leaf or something. Now, though, one of Britain's most loved butterflies is in decline. Numbers of the tortoise shell butterfly have dropped by 73% since the 1970s. For Pete, though, his tropical stock aren't affected. In the 1940s, there would be clouds of hundreds of millions of uh, cabbage white butterflies coming over from the continent. And whether you like them or not, you know, it's a natural phenomenon. And the fact that we've lost that says that things have changed a lot. So, as far as uh, my butterflies are concerned, they're all tropical. They're all very common species that are farmed for the trade. Um, but what I've seen outside, absolutely, uh, the numbers have dropped. I mean, this year there's a butterfly called the small copper. Beautiful butterfly, not that common, not that rare. If you know what you're looking for, you generally see them. The first one should have been out and about in May. I saw my first one two days ago. As numbers of butterflies fall across the nation, Pete and his crowd are taking flight. Well, that brings us to the end of part one, which means it's time for a quiz. Which English cathedral is home to the famous Mapamundi, one of the world's most unique medieval treasures? Is it A, Salisbury, B, Litchfield, or C, Hereford? We'll give you the answer after the break. Welcome back to Digital Nation. And before the break, we asked, which English cathedral is home to the famous Mapamundi, one of the world's most unique medieval treasures? And the answer is C, Hereford Cathedral. The name Mapamundi is Latin for cloth world, which is apt for one of the earliest world maps. What do you do with 10,000 pieces of wood in Scunthorpe? Create a US Army tank, of course. An artist has fused the digital and the physical to construct the life-sized object that's currently wowing visitors in a gallery's courtyard. And with Hull, the new city of culture just down the road, what better time for Scunthorpe to show that anything Hull can do? He decided to find a virtual object and reconstruct that. So he saw some images of the Arab Spring which is um, the Arab uprisings in, in Syria, I think, and he's, there's a famous image of children riding on top of a, riding on top of a tank after, uh, after an uprising. And he really liked the idea of humanity essentially overcoming oppression and overcoming technology. So he looked at this space and was trying to think, actually, what kind of object would fill this space? It's, um, it's quite a large space, so often sculptors will put something in here and they'll think they're really big when they've got them in their studio or in their workshop and they'll come here and they'll, they'll be a bit dwarfed by the church and the size of the square. Yeah, we're, a, so we're a contemporary art gallery so often we get people in saying oh I could do that, we haven't had anyone say that about this. They're, they're pretty impressed, it's an impre impressive thing, there's over, over 10,000 pieces of, of wood in this sculpture. Um, I think he said there were seven miles of, of, of CNC cuts to make it um, and it's taken him over four years to make it so it's a uh, also, it coincides with the um, whole UK City of Culture coming up, so we're looking at ways to, to bring possibly some of that audience over to Scunthorpe and, and help, the, help the economy and make people think about Scunthorpe in a new way where exciting things happen. Now, it may be difficult to believe, but did you know there's Russian royalty buried in a graveyard on Hailing Island? Moving to the UK in 1932, Princess Catherine Yurievska brought a house on the island and was eventually buried there after her death in 1959. This quiet corner of Hailing Island is home to Russian royalty. Princess Catherine Yurievskaya was born into riches as an illegitimate daughter of Tsar Alexander II. He legally married her mother a year before his assassination making Catherine a legitimate princess at the time of his death. She married and had two children with her first husband, but that marriage ended in his death in 1910. She then moved to the south of Russia, to the Crimea, Yalta, and in 1916 she married her second husband. 
and that was obviously the year before the revolution broke out. In 1932, Catherine bought a house called The Haven on Hailing Island. The property was quite a reasonable value here at that point. Uh, it wasn't exactly what you'd say a fashionable place, but it did have a reputation for good sea air, and, and she, she was an asthma sufferer. Catherine passed away just before Christmas in 1959. She had a small funeral that was scarcely attended for a Russian princess. The headstone was neglected and fell into disrepair. But thanks to efforts by the Russian Heritage Committee and the Orthodox Church in Portsmouth, Catherine's headstone has been returned to its former glory. Barely a day goes by when I'm down here, which is once a week perhaps, without someone inquiring about which is the princess's grave. It's just the, the idea of a princess being buried in a churchyard and uh, it's quite popular, it's quite scenic, this part of the, of the, of the island. Uh, there's a lot of footpaths uh, leading from the churchyard and people come and park here and walk and they often visit the church and then see the interest or they've come already um, knowledgeable about the grave and they just want to see it and um, read it, as people do in churchyards, you know, the interesting graves, whether it's a war grave or a princess's grave is a little interesting. Here's something you might want to know next time you're at the doctor's waiting for an injection. Everyone knows that Edward Jenner was the creator of the world's first vaccine. But in actual fact, everyone is wrong. It actually took place in Yetminster in Dorset, and the credit goes to a farmer called Benjamin Jesty. When an epidemic of smallpox came to town in 1774, Farmer Ben, having remembered an old wife's tale about the power of cowpox, scratched the arms of his wife and kids with a darning needle and rubbed the pus-infected udder of a cow against them. When word spread, the locals thought Ben was trying to turn his family into cow people and pelted him at the market. But they all became immune to smallpox, 20 years before Edward Jenner had even started on his vaccine. Proof once again that when it comes to creativity, innovation and being a cowing genius, indoor set mint. Now it's time for one of our four-legged friends to take centre stage. And in Cambridge, there's a new recruit to the search and rescue team, helping to try and set a world record for a game of hide and seek. So let's wish Springador Shadow the best of luck, even if he does only get rewarded with cat food. Meet Shadow, the newest recruit at Cambridge Search and Rescue. Boundless energy and a keen sense of smell make him the perfect companion for the specially trained search team. This is Shadow. Shadow is a six month old Springador, which is Springer Spaniel Cross Labrador. She is our own pet dog, which uh, we have chosen to train up as a search and rescue dog for Kamsar. Um, she started her training when she was eight weeks old with basic obedience. Once she was able to go down on the ground, we started our little find it games by throwing little treats on the ground. If she finds a person, um, she'll be re rewarded with uh, a bowl full of cat food, which she absolutely <laughs> adores. The Lowland Rescue Team has now been helping Cambridgeshire Police to find vulnerable people for over a decade. But less than a month ago, its survival was under threat when the charity found themselves homeless. Now rehomed and with their new recruit in tow, Kamsar are taking on a new challenge. They're putting their search skills to the test in an attempt to break the world record for the largest game of hide and seek. Guinness World Records has a very specific set of rules that we have to stick to. It's got to be an area of less than five hectares, which makes this part of Milton Country Park absolutely perfect. Um, we've got to collect all sorts of evidence, video, the entry and exit points. There will be one seeker, so they're going to get a lot of exercise. When you were young, did you ever want to be a firefighter? Well, in Sheffield, you can get your hands on some of the oldest firefighting machinery in the country, all restored and on display in a museum based in a former fire station. It's 30 years since we've been open to the public uh, on a regular basis, but the collection itself is actually 85 years old this year as well. It's the main aim of the museum is to teach life safety through hands-on learning with history. So um, all the equipment's been, well, originally was designed to be dragged through fires, things like that. So we're a really hands-on museum and you can get hands-on with the equipment and climbing the vehicles as well. 
Yeah. Most museums are behind glass. Yes, everything's coming interactive now, but the museum itself here, the exhibits themselves are physically interactive, so you can get on them, you can physically see the fire engines that used to run out of this fire station right up until the ones that's only just finished service. Sheffield is really important with the history of the emergency services right back from when this place first opened in the 1900s right up until pro uh, present day. So Sheffield across the entire country has been number one virtually for um, for the emergency services in development and that comes back right back to forensic science that was started here in Sheffield as well. So this building is a one-off for what it is. Um, the quick hitch harness systems as well that would have been used in this building, so for the horses to be connected to the horse-drawn fire engines, it took just four seconds to turn out. So when the bells went off, literally, the building was so advanced because they went over to America to have a look at how they did things, um, it took four seconds to get out of the building, where today it takes a minute and a half to two minutes. And finally, if you're the kind of person who likes to sit quietly in a taxi during your journey, then you better watch out for this one in Portsmouth. Using an ancient tradition of entertaining passengers as well as taking them to their destinations, one local cabbie provides a journey with a difference. Many of us know what it's like to get the same old taxi service, but in the silent area, there's one man at least who aims for your ride to be anything but normal. And when I went to meet the Gully Gully man, I was greeted by some interesting sights. If they go in the back, I offer first water and uh, sweets and things like that, and I throw the odd jokes. So my favourite joke, I've just, uh, I, I nicked that from uh, a friend of mine, does it uh, in his performance uh, with a twist. So I give someone uh, a sweet and I say, please, can you share it? Because uh, uh, I don't have any other one. Give me the wrapping paper. I take the wrapping paper. I, I ask them how you, they think about it. Does it taste all right? I found it in the toilet earlier. <laughs> He walked straight into my joke. <laughs> Khaled Hamad calls himself the Gully Gully Man, which he says is an Egyptian tradition. The Gully Gully Man is an Egyptian character, a magician that used to entertain the crowd uh, on cruise ships. And the word Gully comes from uh, uh, the magic word in Egypt, which is uh, Gala Gala. Uh, it's sort of the equivalent to um, Abracadabra or Hocus Pocus. Um, and Gala Gala became Gully Gully, and the man of the Gala Gala became the Gully Gully Man. Gully Man combines his love for jokes and magic with his day job, and I was lucky that he treated me to some of his tricks as well. I started in Egypt as a singer and a musician, uh, but I've always liked the performing side of my life. When I came to England, I studied some drama. Uh, magic, of course, uh, I've always uh, had interest in magic. I wanted to find a job that was flexible enough so that I can go to a, a last-minute booking um, or an audition. I love performing. I would rather be known as the most fun taxi driver in Portsmouth. Uh, that title would, would make my day. Uh, I don't think I'm famous. Um, people deserve to have fun. You know, if you're not having fun, uh, there's something wrong. You can have fun anywhere. That is amazing. That is genuinely amazing. That was one journey I will definitely never forget. And that's it for this week's look around the UK's local TV channels. Don't forget, you can catch up on previous episodes of the show by going to bbc.co.uk forward slash digital nation. Or you can go to the website of your own local TV channel.